All right, so uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Witold. Um, I'm a developer, like all of you. And today I will be presenting a short talk about basics of setup of the environment that you might want to have uh, and you do not necessarily always have. So I have uh, quite a lot of experience. I currently work at uh, Monday.com, uh, one of our sponsors, um, as a so senior software engineer. And there I had quite a lot of um, opportunity to see different kinds of projects that were set up for, for, ja for JavaScript e e ecosystem, but not, not only. And essentially, this presentation is kind of summary of all the good practices that I found and also all the bad practices of like uh, um, fixes for the, all the bad practices that I encountered as well. So um, essentially, what the most important uh, premise of this talk is that I will not be very detailed uh, in, in the configuration. I will not show you like uh, very specific configuration values, more, like, more talk about general things that you should be using. Um, I will, be I will be talking about specific tools, but it doesn't mean that you have to use those specific tools. And uh, those are mostly the ones that I used personally or so in the projects being set up. Um, or I would want to use them, but uh, didn't have the opportunity yet. Um, so essentially, um, I use WebStorm for all my projects. Uh, but if you are using VS Code or any other editor, maybe some NeoVim fans here, um, those things can actually be rep replicated in, in other environments uh, with more or less uh, effort. Um, so why is it important to talk about basics? Because th th this talk is actually like very, very uh, low level, let's say. Um, and I think that it's because uh, it's, really, it's really easy to forget about them. A lot of projects that I see kind of evolved from like a simple script or maybe a very simple service that was supposed to be um, sunset after, I don't know, uh, half a month or something. And it wasn't. Um, it's very easy to achieve a lot of like uh, um, um, actual results with Im Im implementing very basic things that normally um, uh, you would expect them to be there. Uh, it's never too late. And um, the best way to avoid basic mistakes, meaning that uh, those are the guardrails that uh, prevent you from uh, having like a lot of issues in your code base. Um, and essentially, that way, uh, you can prevent uh, basic things happening to you. All right, so um, the very first thing that I would like you to start with is configuring your IDE. Um, or your editor or something that you have and the way to do it if you have a team or even if you have like a, if you are a freelancer and have a single project essentially uh, what you need to do is to make sure that everyone is using the same ID if possible it's not always possible but you should be doing that and also making sure that all the all the settings that are like displayed back on the screen are actually shared between people so how do you do that um, for WebStorm and other JetBrains IDEs, uh, I see a lot of projects actually adding .idea into their gitignore. Don't do that. Um, actually, what you should be doing is add some of those files to git and ignore some of them. Uh, IDEA is actually doing this uh, out of the box already. Uh, and for, for Visual Studio Code, you can just add the VS Code directory, VS Code directory to git. Uh, in that directory, you have two files. One is for the workspace configuration. The second one is for the plug plugins configuration. Um, and that way, you will have the same settings for everyone in your team. Once they pull the project, they will have the, your settings. They will be using everything that you have. Um, first tool that I'd like to talk about is DRENF and NVM. Uh, probably all, everyone used NVM at some point. Um, and if not, I highly recommend it. But another tool that I would like you to use is DRENF. DRENF is essentially a tool that gives you the ability to switch your node version or switch your um, environment variables, including path, for example, uh, once you switch the directory. If you're switching the directory, node version is uh, set, meaning that you have no weird surprises when you are switching between projects and one is in node 16 and the other is in node 20. You're trying to debug something for 30 minutes and it turns out that it's just wrong node version. Happened a lot, way more often than you would expect. Um, 
Another solution that you can have um, is actually putting your database connections into the configuration of the editor. Uh, JetBrains can do that. There are also plugins for VS Code. You can essentially have like a shared configuration to connect to staging environment, local environment uh, databases. You don't have to send them on over Slack or have like a repository with them or something. Um, create a Docker file. Uh, there are also very good tools to um, share the, co the, the, the environments between different uh, team members, but I won't describe them because they are pretty complex. Uh, Codespaces, DevEnv, uh, all of them actually solve the same um, issue. All right, so another thing, uh, code navigation. Uh, if you want to have a very good experience in your IDE, uh, define a project structure. Nobody does that, at least I didn't see uh, a lot of people doing that. You can actually share that configuration with your team. Exclude known modules from search results, it will improve your life. Uh, mark directories with tests, that way you will see them uh, when you're searching uh, in, the, in your IDE, you will see that these are tests, they are not necessarily what you're looking for. Um, Define file scopes for different projects. If you have multiple projects or have like a separate part of the code responsible for front end, back end, or maybe NPM packages, color them. Make them colorful. That way you will be able to see, especially if you have like business logic that is shared between projects um, and is using like all the same file names like account.ts, you will actually see which account is from the back end, which account is from the front end. It will simplify your life uh, quite a lot and use the go-to usage definition instead of text search. It's much more convenient. I've seen a lot of people using just code search because like uh, just a regular text search because it's easier to do. Uh, but if you have good types, good documentation, you can actually use uh, like navigation over the code. It's very easy and uh, nice, I would say. And as I said, if you use TypeScript, it's much, <laughs> much nicer. Um, and about uh, another thing that you can do define the run and debug configurations for your environment in Git and make them shared between team members. Setting up your debug configuration, uh, setting up ports and everything that you need to uh, just run the code takes quite a lot of time for, especially for new team members, especially for team members who are more junior to you. So that way you will be able to essentially just get going from the start without actually having a lot of steps to do the setup. Um, also set up some actions on save, such as code formatting, um, such as uh, import optimization and auto fixing of the linter rules. Um, Slint has a pretty good uh, auto fix, other linters as well. You can actually use them and they will make your life easier. You can see magic is happening on save. Uh, quite a lot of things are uh, jumping, so sometimes can be a little bit uh, problematic, but in general, it's very, very useful. You should do that. Um, AI tools. So GitHub Copilot uh, went viral last week, uh, last year. Uh, so I think uh, I've used it a lot. I don't know if everyone of you used it, but I highly recommend it. It's worth the money, totally. Um, and I think uh, it's gonna change the way you work. It improves quite a lot of tasks or, or of your day-to-day -day that uh, you would spend a lot of time doing. Um, instead, you can just use the tool and spend your time on doing like a good architecture or anything else. All right, um, another tool that I find very useful is LintStage. LintStage essentially gives you the ability to uh, apply commands on only on the files that are changed in your commit. That way you can apply, for example, uh, Slint or Prettier or uh, any other tool uh, only on the files that you changed, meaning you, it, it just runs, fa run, runs faster, right? Um, it also gives you a little bit of a more superpower because you don't, if you're introducing new tool to your stack, uh, to your project, it actually gives you the ability to only apply it to the files that actually changed, like to the new files, so you don't have to rewrite your whole code base uh, with the new standards, just use them in the new files, use them in the files that you're changing, fix the things as you go and not in one big go. Um, so automate those things um, using Git hooks. Git hooks will give you the ability to run lint staged on, um, on commit or on push. Uh, and use Husky to make sure that every team member from your team actually has those Git hooks applied and you will not get to know um, that, that something is not working on your CI when, once they merge to master or something. Um, so code quality control such as Slint and Prettier are actually pretty important as well. Um, they give you power to uh, make sure that 
your code base is actually compliant with quite a lot of uh, good practices in terms of uh, structure of the code, but also in terms of uh, formatting. No more discussions about uh, whether we should use spaces or tabs or some other silly things. Uh, those things can be defined in a configuration. Forget about those discussions, do them once, and then just apply everything to your code base and just do it. Um, and also, you should run those tools in multiple places, not just uh, on commit, for example, but also on push, also on your CI. Essentially, block the PR merge. If, it, if it's not compliant, it shouldn't be able to merge. Like It shouldn't be a discussion where you see like a failing check on the pipeline and say, yeah, but you know, this is pretty complex or something, or this is old code. No, just fix it. Uh, or add it to a, like a ignore rule on top of the file, but fix it so that it doesn't break for others. And also additional points for writing your own rules. This is uh, quite important as well. Like you need to make sure you're actually capable of writing them. Uh, I think uh, a lot of you would be very surprised how easy it is to write your custom S-Link rule. You already have access to AST essentially, meaning that you can uh, compare just objects in the, in the memory. Like you can see, okay, I have like an if statement and that is the being uh, that, that, that has an else and we have a return in that else but we don't have a uh, and we have a return outside of a, uh, that else so let's just uh, fail the thing with uh, some kind of message obviously that one would be caught by IDE but you get the point all right so also there is a tool uh, that I would recommend danger.js it's pretty nice uh, this is specifically for writing your own rules uh, it gives you an API to AST once again, uh, and it actually can write PR comments and block merges, which is very useful because if you want to have some kind of uh, message to the developer, you don't want to, for example, block the merge, but what, whatever they are doing, uh, your team found that this can lead to some weird bugs and you need to make sure that something actually works. You can just uh, write a rule that will add a PR message to the, to the, to the PR and they will be informed about the stuff that you have uh, found before. You will not be needing to do this, code, this kind of code review again. Um, uh, and again, run those on git commit, git push, run it, in, uh, run, run it on pipeline, disable the uh, PR merges. That way it will all happen automatically. This is a very important part of this whole talk, like automate everything. Every single tool that you have, automate it, make sure that everyone has it and that it's impossible to skip, or at least it's very hard to skip. That way, uh, nobody <laughs> will be trying to do that. And if they do, they will have uh, like a good talk with their manager. Um, and some ideas for good rules uh, for danger. Uh, one of them actually we are using. Uh, so for example, if you updated your package JSON but didn't update your package log, it's probably uh, an issue with dependencies as long as you don't have some kind of other configuration there. So just even if you don't block a PR like this because maybe you have your configuration for just in package JSON, that's fine, I don't judge. Uh, but essentially, at least you will have a comment, hey, maybe verify that it's correct and that you didn't forget to just uh, run yarn install and commit your package log. Uh, that way you will prevent quite a lot of uh, mistakes at least. Or maybe just, uh, you know, uh, you know that some tables n cannot be migrated automatically because they are too huge and will cause a downtime. This happens as well. So just uh, prevent those kinds of migrations being committed into the repository and deployed into production. Um, code quality control. There is uh, quite a lot of uh, tools that do similar things to the ones that I described before, um, but they are written by like a pretty big companies and they provide you a lot more control over your code base. Uh, so essentially, these would be like uh, SonarCube, CodeClimate, and Ball. I would say that one of the most important things that they give you out of the box is the metrics, meaning that you can actually see uh, how your code base improves over time, which gives uh, everyone quite a big like uh, boost of morale when you see that the co test coverage is rising, that uh, every single thing that you are doing is actually improving things. Even if, even if those are small things, you see that the improvement is happening and that you're not uh, essentially having a rotting code base, but th the one is that is going into the correct direction. Um, so some of other tools that I won't have time uh, to actually uh, present, but uh, are worth mentioning. Uh, one of them is actually um, GitLeaks. GitLeaks prevents some uh, secret leaking from your repository. Again, pretty useful. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you don't want to commit your AWS secret into your repository and find out that you have $200,000 to pay for them. Editor config is a small tool that gives you the ability to um, apply the very basic format heat configuration, uh, but it's very widely used, which means that you can actually um, have the same code formatting, at least the basic one, like using tab spaces, uh, maybe uh, maybe where the, what kind of line endings you want, but it will be supported by pr basically every single editor that I can think of, uh, including NeoVim. Um, custom Git attributes, this gives you the ability to customize, for example, an output of your git diff command. Uh, can be useful if you're using some kind of uh, specific language or specific file where you would want to have the header of the diff different. Um, generally, security scanning tools such as SNCC uh, for dependency scanning, making sure that your, all your dependencies are up to date, um, but also container scanning tools such as Spectral, uh, where you have um, different kinds of, uh, different kinds of uh, checks and rules that check that your Docker file is uh, up to date and has correct uh, dependencies and you don't use some kind of packages that are outdated. And um, another one is Emmet. I don't know if anyone used Emmet, but it's, it's kind of uh, not that important anymore uh, since the time then when the copilot came, but I used it uh, very extensively for generating larger um, parts of code where you had like very complex HTML structure or CSS structure. Um, that you wanted to generate. Uh, you just used a very simple language based on CSS selectors, uh, and that gave you the ability to essentially generate like a whole web page uh, using just some selectors. Uh, very nice, I would highly recommend it. All right, so I did speed up a little bit, uh, so we have a little bit more time, but uh, I would gladly essentially um, talk about any tool from those that I mentioned um, a little bit longer if you're interested. So. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Whoa. Yep. Whoa. Yeah, I uh, applied lightning <laughs> talk okay. to this. All right, so there was a question in, in the back, I think. One, two, one, two, one, yep. one, 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 one. Please remember, think your question out in advance <laughs> and be sure that it is a question rather than a statement in the, f a f question in the form of a statement, yeah. Uh, because we're giving away uh, a free ticket to this year's Conference JS for the most thoughtful, insightful question. Go ahead. I think there was someone back here. Uh, okay. I was just curious what uh, custom ESLint rules uh, you implemented. Okay, um, specifically for our team, I didn't implement a custom ESLint rule. I did install some plugins. Um, those plugins were actually for controlling uh, imports in the project to make sure that, uh, first of all, essentially we want to have our imports uh, being absolute uh, using a specific uh, aliases for the path. So that means that we will be able, and what's even more cool about that is someone who wrote that plugin is actually uh, wrote also autofix rule for this that reads the, uh, the, the path. So on save, I actually um, can write like a relative file, path to the file, but I'm getting a full path to the file, including those uh, path aliases, which is really nice, and it basically auto-fixes the code automatically, which is really good. Thank you very much. Uh, before the next question, uh, how many of you intermediate and uh, senior, uh, let's say, developers found this information very useful? Ha-ha, <laughs> you see. Right. So this is basic and still very necessary. Uh, next question. We never get to that side of the room. <laughs> Ross, well, thank you. Uh, so one question, can you describe some uh, very uh, interesting case about Copilot? Interesting case about Copilot, all right. Uh, I actually have a very good story about this. Uh, I w is it, it isn't mine personally, I watched a YouTube video of a guy called Andreas Kling. I don't know if some of you know him. He's essentially creating an operating uh, system from scratch and writing his own like uh, Obviously not just him, but uh, quite, a lot, quite a large group of people. But he's, he was implementing JIT for JavaScript, uh, of all things. And Copilot was actually able to uh, autocomplete a code that was doing translation between um, entities from 
essentially like the language, like JavaScript virtual machine opcodes into assembly. So he was essentially compiling into assembly the code that we had, he had in, uh, in his like uh, virtual machine for JavaScript. And it was actually really good. Uh, probably it was trained on some kind of Chrome source code or something, but it was co like uh, auto-completing very complex assembly code um, in a way that saved him, I think, at least 20 minutes. Uh, you do have to remember that he is one of the authors of Chrome, uh, like he was working on, uh, on, not Chrome, WebKit specifically. So uh, when the copilot made a mistake, he was able to spot it quite quickly. I think that uh, this is not something that we would be able to do. Um, at least not all of us, but uh, I think that it was very good use case. Like I, I was actually amazed how good it was. It never works for me like that. I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe I have two, two simple projects, essentially. <laughs> projects are too simple. That's funny. How many Most of you are using Copilot? I'm just curious. Oh, it seems like mm -hmm. a almost vast majority. OK, I think we have time for one more thoughtful. Hold on a second. Wait, you can come to the front. Come on, go to the front right here. Yeah. This Okay, first to the front and then to the back. We have time for two more. Let's do that. Yeah, hello, uh, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I do have somewhere uh, like a checklist of uh, all these instruments, tools, uh, somewhere on GitHub, maybe on LinkedIn. It would be very useful. Yeah, I will share this presentation, essentially. Um, it's actually shortened, because <laughs> uh, it was part of like a 45-minute talk that I presented before. Um, but uh, I have the, tool, the, the whole presentation, and I can actually create like a list of links to every tool. Uh, so that they are clickable on the presentation. So um, I guess. Uh, Do you also have a full index of every available application and? No, <laughs> no, absolutely <laughs> not. But uh, the, all, all, of all the ones that uh, I mentioned here, I think uh, it's worth to, to essentially just check it. But uh, even if I don't do the, um, actually the URL for the browser for the presentation is pretty simple. Um, so maybe some of them, you, some of you can actually just save it. <laughs> It's developerbasics.pages.musovnovskypl, so it's hosted online. You can actually just open the presentation. There is also some commented out uh, slides there, so you can browse through them in the source code as well. Really clear presentation, by the way. We had one more question in the back, uh, right here in the middle first, and then the back. We have time. He was very brief. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I would have a question about the uh, IDE. Mm -hmm. uh, so you said that uh, it's better to um, to say like, okay, we are using only one. Yep. But uh, what are your tips for the configuration if there is like a split in the team, yeah, that uh, some people want to use, let's say like WebStorm, the other ones VS Code. Um, so so what would, you, uh, would be your hint to, to configure uh, for the configuration? Yeah, I mean, uh, I would have basically two solutions to that. Um, one would be either have like a happy path when you can't really spend enough re time and resources to configure both um, or as many as people have and say, look, we, ha we have a happy path and then uh, essentially if anyone is using the thing uh, in a different way, you're on your own, on your own but promote actually co committing their own configuration into the repository so that if they do it for themselves, or they also do it for the next person who joins and uses the same toolkit, that's one thing. Um, second, uh, second point to that is that th those checks and all the formatting and everything should happen on a CI anyway. Meaning that if you have an action on save or if you have um, some kind of linter rules, they should be verified on CI anyway. So even if someone is not using those uh, IDE integrations, they can still, uh, they, they still cannot break the experience for everyone else on the team. And like the second solution would essentially be just create both our free configurations for all of them. But uh, this might be a little bit too much for like a, uh, let's say commercial project where you have, this is why I recommend to have one uh, because it simplifies a lot of things. We are not using in a company only single one. Everyone has like completely free choice which I respect and I actually like about, uh, about us that, but uh, still, if I, if I were the one making the decisions for like my project, I would probably recommend everyone to use the single one. I think that the I in IDE stands for integrated, right? So yep. that, that implies that everyone is pretty much using the same tools, I guess. Uh, someone in the background suggested the solution to, the answer to your question is combat. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, last that question works we as well, but uh, <laughs> can be a little bit uh, <laughs> like detrimental for the <laughs> yeah. for the team capacity. I, I just thought it was funny because of where we are. Okay. Can you hear? Oops. Yep. Sorry. <sighs> okay. So uh, I've seen that most of the examples are where from the IntelliJ or WebStorm, right? Yep. So uh, you probably know this uh, shortcut double shift. Yeah. Okay. It's amazing. Yeah, I know, um, but um, uh, n not for a long time, but uh, VS Code supports uh, double keystrokes as mm -hmm. shortcuts. So you could, if you want to feel, you, if you want to substitute this luxury uh, WebStorm provides, you, you can have that on VS Code as well. That's, that's it. Was that a qu question? <laughs> <laughs> that was a follow-up okay. comment. Pani Vitogu. Yep. Of the questions that you heard, which question would you say was, let's say, the best question? And please tell us why. All right. So I think the best question was essentially about using multiple IDEs because uh, it's a problem that happens quite a lot that people want to use their own tools. They don't re really don't like uh, having like a standard put on top of them. Um, and I've seen it in, in person, like I did the configuration for my, my team, but a lot of team members are using VS Code. And uh, that's what I'm saying uh, about like looking, uh, not using the uh, symbol navigation for some reason, I don't know. Um, they're using like a basic text search. Uh, maybe th that's because uh, IntelliJ is a little bit better at symbol navigation, or maybe it's because uh, I honestly don't know why. But uh, essentially what I'm saying, sorry? Yeah, the company is paying for the IntelliJ, so. Your company. <laughs> true, <laughs> true, that's true. That's a good point, that's a very good point, actually. Um, so maybe, you know, we, I think, uh, who wants to li give a lightning talk because there is a yearly IntelliJ uh, li license to be won. Um, yeah. So that was, the, that was for your yes, best that question. Was definitely. that your question? Sir, in the that was your question, yeah. yes? Congratulations, that was great. Give her a big hand, please. <laughs> And also, let's have another hand for Pani Vitolja. Give him a big hand. That was a really clear, and thank, thank you, you also for being one of our sponsors. <laughs> we really <laughs> appreciate it. We Reports. really appreciate it, and you were uh, fantastic with your presentation. Very clear, yes? And useful information. Thank you so much.